Okay, I'm going to explain why we are very likely in the final, actually more like the final five years. We're probably, there's probably five years left. We're probably beyond seven years. We're probably beyond the final seven years. And the reason I say that is this. All those teachers who teach the rider on the white horse is the Antichrist. You guys are false and lying teachers. And anybody who's believed that teaching, you need to rethink that. John sees the rider on the white horse in Revelation 6.1 come into the throne room of God in heaven. He's summoned into the throne room by one of the four living creatures. It was Jesus who pulls the seal. And then the four living creatures, one of them says, come see. And all of a sudden, into the throne room of God in heaven, the rider on the white horse appears. And is given instructions, whatever was written on the, on the scroll. He also receives a crown in the throne room of God. And then he rides out as a conqueror bent on conquest. Y'all are wrong. Most people don't know this. But from 1815 to 1914, there was 99 years of world peace. Then the first seal. I mean, then the second seal. The second seal is World War I. And... What happened after the second seal? The Great Depression. The third seal is the Great Depression. The fourth seal. What happened after the Great Depression? World War II. The, the, okay, and so in 1492, Christopher Columbus discovered the New World. That's when France, Spain, Portugal, and Great Britain sent out conquerors bent on conquest to conquer the new world and they were they went with all the same authority as the royal crown and they carried bows a bow was the weapon of the day and all these conquerors they all looked for a white horse to ride in and conquer on because that's what conquerors do there's a guy named Cortez Hermon Cortez they named the sea of Cortez after him he went into the he conquered the Aztec Empire with like 12 guys. They 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 pulled up in the in, in their ships, unloaded their ships and their horses, and they literally walked into what is current day Mexico City and they told Quetzalcoatl, "We own you. We come in the name and all the power and authority of the great king of Spain." If you do not surrender, we will send our armies and completely destroy this place. And Quetzalcoatl said, no problem. We belong to you. You're our new boss. No war, no fighting. He walked in and conquered the place without even firing a musket shot. Without even using his bow. Why do we speak Spanish in South America? Why do we speak English in North America? Because of the conquerors bent on conquest. Then there were wars and wars and wars over the New World. Who would control the New World? Then around 1815, there was world peace for 99 years. Then the second seal is a fiery red horse. Did you know World War I was the first fiery war where they dropped bombs out of airplanes and, and used machine guns? The second seal is fulfilled by World War I. The, the, the fourth seal is fulfilled by World War II. So everybody who teaches that the, that the tribulation period begins when the rider on the white horse comes out, they're wrong. That's hundreds of years ago. That started hundreds of years ago. I'm telling you, I know this to be fact because the Lord told me this. And just because these teachers who teach this false teaching don't know history, and they don't even know that there was a, almost a hundred years of world peace just before World War I. I'm just saying, they don't know history. Okay, so here's, a, here's what I'm saying. The actual tribulation period begins when the hour of God's judgment and Babylon the Great falls. And from that point, there's 42 months left. That's what the Bible says. Okay, the hour of God's judgment. So, after Revelation chapter 14, verse 6. The gospel goes out to every nation, language, tribe, and people. What happens when the gospel is out? 
What happens when God says that mission is complete and the angel in charge of the gospel? Now remember, in the book of Revelation, there's an angel in charge of the fire. There's an angel in charge of the waters. Okay? There's an angel in charge of all the seven churches. To the angel of the church of this, to the angel of the church of Pergamum, to the angel of the church of Ephesus. There's an angel in charge of each of the churches. Well, guess what? There's also an angel in charge of the rapture. He's seated on a cloud in Revelation chapter 14, verse 14. There's an angel in charge of, the, of, of giving the warning of the mark of the beast. Revelation chapter 14, verse 9 through 11. There's an angel in charge of, Babylon, of the fall of Babylon the Great. You'll see him in Revelation chapter 14, verse, I think it's verse 7 and 8. Where he says, fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great. He reappears in Revelation chapter 18 and gives all sorts of details about the fall of Babylon the Great. Well, the angel in charge of the rapture came to me and gave me a revelation of the book of Revelation. He's also the writer on the... He, the angel in charge... Okay, the riders on the white horse are four archangels. Okay, I don't know if... I know the rider on the black horse is the archangel Michael. And the reason he's he, he rides a black horse is because he's a warrior. He's he's not a very nice guy. He doesn't cut. He doesn't show up to give you a message. He shows up to cut the cut the enemies of God in half, and slice their arms off and rip their eyes out. That's what the archangel Michael. That's what he does. He do, he's not Gabriel. He doesn't show up saying greetings. I I have good tidings. He does not do that. He's not the angel of the gospel either who shows up saying, Good news, Jesus died for our sins. No. He's the angel who shows up with the sword and rips people to shreds. And that's why he destroys the economies of the world. That You know why he destroys the economy? For the sake of God's people. Because it's always the wicked people who become rich, 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 rich. And then, and then that's why he, he'll come and bring them down so that God's people can... Get back into the economy. What's going on with the riots all over the United States? Today is like June 1st. What's going on with these riots? This is the second beast that rises out of the earth. Okay? The Black Lives Matter Antifa group. Now, the Babylon the Great has not yet fallen. But when Babylon the Great falls, Russia and China are going to come rising out of the out of the sea, that's Revelation chapter 13, the bear is Russia, the dragon is China, the, uh, the leopard is Islam, so Islam plus Russia and China come rising out of the sea, that means the beast has a navy. This is after the stars fall from the sky and the sky is rolled up like a scroll, that's nuclear war. So Babylon the Great Falls, it's nuclear war, it's a one hour war. You can have five nuclear strikes in one hour. What I'm telling you is we are in the last seven years and it's not the tribulation period yet. The tribulation period begins when Babylon the Great falls. That's why it's called the hour of God's judgment. And from that time, the beast has 42 months to reign. 42 months. There's 10 leaders of the beast. Revelation 17, 12. The beast comes to power in one hour. Revelation 17, 12. The ten leaders are Putin, Jinping, Kim Jong-un, the Ayatollah, Trudeau, Obama, Macron. And you'll find out when this happens, when World War III happens, then at the same time that the beast is rising out of the sea and Russia and China is rising out of the sea, at that same time, you're going to have the Antifa and the Black Lives Matter taking up arms and killing the police just like they're doing now. They've already started. The fact that this thing has already started and we're seeing this war and Obama, all these prophecies about Obama, he's going to be back. He keeps coming back. And remember, Obama stepped off the scene for how long? A couple of years. And then all of a sudden he's seen giving some sort of speech to graduates and I, the last thing I remember him saying is talking about taking the initiative or taking back the initiative those are military terms and then all of a sudden what happens within two weeks we got riots we got police being shot and killed and people being run over and businesses being burned this is the secret power of lawlessness how Obama will get up and tell the public I want to be your next president and I'm all for you and I, I'm in favor of gay marriage. Meanwhile, he's a Muslim. He goes to the Muslims. I'm a Muslim. How are you going to tell the gays you're, 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 
you're in favor of gay marriage and then go to the Muslims and say you're a Muslim. Don't Muslims murder gays? Because it's the secret power of lawlessness. Behind the scenes, he's secretly telling his Muslim factions, okay, attack now, or okay, do this. The deep state. He's part of the deep state. He's part of the Iranian alliance with Russia and China. Remember he sent all that money to Russia? I mean, to, to Iran. And what did Iran use that money for in the Iran Iranian nuclear deal? Where they really want to get nukes. And you know who's holding back Iran from getting nukes? When Netanyahu went to Putin and said, Listen, are you crazy or something? Are you crazy, Putin? You know that when Iran gets nukes, you're not going to have control of when World War III happens. Because Iran's going to start World War III. And, and, and Russia thought about it. And Putin thought about it and said, You're right. We'll, we'll, we'll work with you to keep them from having nukes. Because they know that Islam is completely out of control and needs to be crushed and kept at the, at, under your feet. But they're dumb for, for even letting <laughs> Obama. See, they know Obama's a Russian asset. Obama got to, if they were manipulating elections in 2016, and we all, it only hit the news in 2016. 18, then what's that tell you? They were probably manipulating elections from the day Obama got his first election win. I'm just telling you, the secret power of lawlessness, what's that mean? The secrets that you don't know, the lies, they get up and tell you one thing and then secretly they're saying another thing. Obama getting up and saying, oh, I'm a, I think these people who are writing need to really sit back and think about what they're doing and all this stuff. Meanwhile, he's on the phone with his Islamic faction saying, okay, it's time to take the initiative and start fighting. I'm just telling you, the secret power of lawlessness is at work. So those of you who think that it's going to be a pre-tribulation rapture, guess what? You don't get to decide that. God makes that decision, and just the fact that there's a huge debate over it means that you're not right. Post-tribulation, that's wrong too. Mid-tribulation, that's wrong too. Pre-wrath, that's wrong too. Because none of these terms are found in the Bible. I'll tell you what's right. After the gospel goes out to every nation, Re uh, Revelation chapter 14, 6, the angel in charge of the gospel. The gospel goes out to every nation, language, tribe, and people. And what's that angel do at the very end of the age? He says, fear God and give him glory. Worship him who made the heavens and the earth. Why does he say that? Because too many people are, are idol worshipers and are going to take the mark of the beast. So he says, worship God. And he says, oh, by the way, the hour of God's judgment has come. So by the, And then the very next angel steps on the scene. A second angel followed Revelation 14, 7 and 8. And says, fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great. That means Babylon the Great falls. Then what happens next? It's a clear sequence of events because a third angel followed. And says, anyone who takes the mark of the beast, you know, will be tormented, you know, and the smoke of her burning rises forever and the wine press of God's wrath. And then what happens? What happens after the mark of the beast? This calls for patient endurance. And people who teach that, oh, well, that's just for the Jews. You're going to find out. Because we are Israel. All them that believe. Are, see, this is what the Lord spoke to me. He said, when you see the word Jacob, that represents is the unbelieving Jews. When you see Israel, that means all is we are the children of the promise, those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. The great multitude that you see in Revelation 7 verse 9, that's them that believe, the Christians who love the Lord. Revelation 15 2, them that believe. The 24 elders, guess what? They don't represent the church. The 20, Elijah is one of the 24 elders. Enoch is one of the 24 elders. Elijah was raptured. Where'd he go? He's one of the 24 elders. We are already in the last seven years, but it begins at the hour of God's judgment when the, when the sixth seal happens and the stars fall from the sky and then the sky is rolled up like a scroll and everybody's hiding in the caves of the rocks and the dens of the mountains. Revelation 6, verse 12 through 17. Okay? That is full-scale worldwide thermonuclear war. That's the hour of God's judgment. 
And what John sees there is minute 55 of the hour. You want to see minute 1 of the hour of God's judgment? Look at Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12 verse um, 4. Where the enormous red dragon is China. Sends stars from the sky to the earth. That's minute 1 of the hour of God's judgment. We're not going to have stars falling from the sky three, four different times. No, it happens once. Jesus mentioned it. He said no one knows the day or the hour. He was talking about the day of Christ and our being gathered to him. That's the rapture and the hour, which is the hour of God's judgment. Jesus was talking about two events. And in Matthew chapter 24, verse 29 through 31, he says, After the tribulation of those days... The tribulation of those days is all the hardships we experience before Babylon the Great Falls. Then after Babylon the Great Falls, the hour of God's judgment, nuclear war, after nuclear war, it becomes distress unequaled from the beginning and, until now and never to be equaled again. That's what he meant. After the distress of those days comes a new distress unequaled, never to be equaled again. Y'all need to understand that because Jesus said after the distress of those days, the stars will fall from the sky and then the sign in the sky of the coming of the Son of Man, the stars falling from the sky is World War III nuclear war, same event as Revelation 12, 4, where the dragon sends stars from the sky to the earth, same event as Revelation, as the sixth seal, Revelation chapter 6, verse 12. And the sign in the sky of the coming of the Son of Man is also the same as the sky rolled up like a scroll. That's a mushroom cloud from nuclear strike. Okay? Now, anybody thinks we're, we're still seven years away from that? The beast is already rising out of the earth right here in the United States. Starting when Obama said, let's take back the initiative on, in, in public. Meanwhile, Iran, all these, um, every Chinese immigrant, China is behind it too. It's Russia, China, North Korea, Iran, and Turkey. So this means that all these legal citizens, all these Muslims who are legal citizens who went out and bought guns legally, unless they have a criminal record, in which case hopefully we can arrest them and confiscate their firearms, but they're keeping those firearms hidden. I'm just telling you, we are in the last seven years, okay? The question is, when does, when does Babylon the Great fall? When is the hour of God's judgment? No one knows the day or the hour except the Father. Jesus even said the Father does know the day and the hour. Okay, so the gospel goes out to every nation, language, tribe, and people. Revelation 14, 6. Then Revelation 14, 7, 8. The hour of God's judgment comes and Babylon the Great falls. That's World War III. Then, the mark of the beast comes out. The beast comes to power, and the mark of the beast comes out. Then what happens? This calls for patient endurance, Revelation 14, 12, and faithfulness. What's patient endurance mean? Endurance means a long-term thing. It's not a short run. It's a, it's a marathon. Faithfulness, meaning standing firm in your faith. Then what happens? Revelation chapter 14, 13. The, the Lord is going to say, blessed are those who die in the Lord from henceforth. At that point, we've reached the 1,335th day of the book of Daniel, chapter 12, verse 11. If you don't understand that, from the hour of God's judge, judgment, back it up 1,290 days, and you have the begin, you, you'll find some event. I don't know what that event is, but that's the beginning. Then... From the hour of God's judgment, 45 days later, God is going to say, Blessed are those who die in the Lord from henceforth. That's the 1,335th day. From the hour of God's judgment, the, there's 42 months begins. So the 1,260 days that the, that the two witnesses prophesy begins at the hour of God's judgment, the hour that Babylon the Great falls. This has all been revealed to me. Finally, it's finally time for this to be revealed. The um, And it doesn't matter if you believe it or not, because history is going to prove what I'm saying is true. So after World War III, just know this, you're going to have to stand firm in your faith for 45 days, and at 45 days, God says, blessed are those who die in the Lord from now on. Then I believe it's a 10-day period of massacre. But I don't know, because nobody knows the day or the hour. 
Okay, I don't know from the time from the 1,335th day. It doesn't say anything else. I'm going by the book of Revelation where it says a 10-day period. But I could be wrong. I, could, I don't know. To be honest about these little details, I don't know. But I will tell you this. We are in the last seven years. And they're, all the teachers who teach about the book of Revelation, they're wrong about the 24 elders representing the church because the seven lampstands represent the church. And in Revelation chapter 4, we see the seven lampstands right there with the 24 elders. And Jesus said the seven lampstands represent the church in Revelation chapter 1 verse 20. I'm going to go with what Jesus said. So when you have 24 elders here and you also have seven lampstands, which one represents the church? It's not both of them. So I'm going to go with what Jesus said. So that makes all the teachers of the, uh, uh, that teach that the 24 elders represent the church, that makes them all false teachers. That when they say that that rider on the white horse is the Antichrist, how are you going to say he's the Antichrist when he appears in the throne room of heaven of God? How are you going to say that? And this same angel is in charge of the rapture. So now you've just said that the angel in charge of the rapture is the Antichrist. You've just offended the very angel that holds the key to that door, the open door in heaven. Revelation chapter 14 verse 14 is the angel in charge of the rapture. He's also the same angel who rides out as a conqueror bent on conquest. I'm just telling you. Now somebody might say, well you just said that, uh, that the rider, that the conquerors bent on conquest happened in 1492. Yes, that's right. And they rode out from Spain, Portugal, Great Britain, France to conquer. And the gospel followed right behind them. Missionaries. That's why if you go to Los Angeles, you'll see like Los Angeles is Spanish for the angels. You see all sorts of Santa Cruz means Holy Cross. That's California. Mission Viejo is in California. It's a mission. That's where Mission Viejo was. Mission, I mean, there's all sorts of Spanish and Christian names of all the cities and towns. You know, San Bernardino means Saint Bernardino. San Rafael. I'm just saying, it's, it's, Christianity invaded the, the new world starting in 1492. So in the natural you had conquerors bent on conquest who were, who were out to get the gold and the silver. That's why they have Spanish galleons. Haven't you ever heard of the stories of the Spanish galleons that sunk in the, uh, in, in, in the Caribbean? And every once in a while it's discovered and somebody comes up with a bunch of gold artifacts from 1530 or 1592 that was when the conquerors bent on conquest were going and pilfering the new world and the native people of North America and South America and taking all their gold and taking it back to the king of uh, Spain um, Lord uh, what else? Okay, so after the mark of the beast comes out, Revelation chapter 14, verse 9 through 11, then patient endurance and faithfulness, Revelation 14, verse uh, 12 and 13, then martyrs, Revelation 14, 13. Then the rapture happens in Revelation 14, verse 14 through 20. Now somebody might say, how is there two harvests? Read Matthew chapter 13, verse 37 through 41, Jesus is speaking of the end of the age, and he says that the weeds are bundled and thrown into the fire. Those are the grapes that are thrown into the wine press of God's wrath. Um, and then the wheat is taken into the barn. We see the rapture happens in Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. We see a multitude in heaven before the Lamb of God, in the throne room of God. That's where, just before that, the rapture happens somewhere around Revelation 7, 2 or 7, 3. Because God says, do not harm the earth, the land or the sea or any tree until we seal with the seal of God. That means God's about to pour out his wrath in Revelation chapter 7, verse 3. So the rapture happens somewhere after Revelation 7, 1. Or 7-2. Somewhere in there. And notice there's no multitude in heaven in Revelation chapter 4 and 5. Because the rapture hasn't happened yet. In the fifth seal, Revelation chapter 6, verse uh, 9 through 11. 
God says, wait a little longer until the number is completed. Those are to be put to death for their faith. People who teach that there's some big revival after the rapture, you are so wrong. God is pouring out his wrath on the inhabitants of the earth. And the, and the only people who are servants of God are the 144,000. And two of them are the two witnesses. And over a period of 1,260 days, all of them are put to death. Including the two witnesses. But the two witnesses prophesy the full 1,260 days and are put to death at the very end. And the reason they have so much power is they're carrying every mantle. They carry... The two witnesses carry the mantle of Elijah, the mantle of Moses, the mantle of Amos, the mantle of uh, Joshua, the mantle of Joseph, the mantle of Paul, the mantle of Peter. They're all carrying every mantle on the face of the planet. So anybody comes near them, they got like a hundred angels around them. And then on the day they're, they're due to be put to death, those angels back away and allow them to glorify God with their death so they receive the martyr's crown. Whoo! Hallelujah. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. I'm speaking by the power of the Holy Spirit right now. <laughs> and Elijah must come and restore all things. What's Elijah do? He restores the truth. I'm not saying I'm that. What I'm saying is the spirit of Elijah has been prophesied over me so many times it's not even funny. Not even funny. I walked into Bethel Church and the, and the guy up there who's acknowledged as a prophet, I don't know if he's a, even a disciple yet, according to, uh, according to Luke 14.33, those that we call apostles and prophets, many of them aren't even disciples yet. Okay, read Luke 14.33. Anybody who wants to come follow me, I think Jesus said in the same way, if you do, anyone who does not give up everything you have cannot be my disciple. What Jesus said to the rich young ruler, he said, there's one thing you lack if you want to be perfect. Go sell everything you have and give to the poor. Then you'll have treasures in heaven. Then come follow me. You say, who can do that? Hey, Paul did it. John did it. Peter did it. Elijah did it. Elisha did it. I'm just saying I did it. And when I did it, I, I had visions, revelation. I was caught up into the spirit realm. I went to, I mean, I've seen visions of heaven. I've seen so many visions. I mean, the angel of the gospel came to me and said, I am the rider on the white horse. I'm also found in Revelation chapter 14, verse 14, seated on a cloud. And then he said, I'm also part of the army of God in Revelation chapter 19, 14. And then all of a sudden his voice reverberated and like thunder, he said, I am the angel in charge of the rapture. And he didn't actually say rapture. He said, harvest at the end. He said a word in tongues that I interpreted to mean the harvest at the end of the age. And it interprets to rapture. Okay, so. And this is the same angel that's so similar to God that John tries to worship him in Revelation chapter. I think it's chapter 20. The Bible says, John, I, I fell down on my face to worship him. And he said, don't do that. I'm a fellow servant with you. And then he says, the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. So even John, a guy who walked with, with the Lord, an apostle, confused this angel with being, is this the Lord? Like he couldn't, And he fell down on his face thinking, this is the Lord. I better get on my face. And, then he, and the angel said, no, 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 no. I'm just a servant to God, just like you. Okay, so time is running out. Time is running out. And all the people who teach a pre-tribulation rapture, the day is coming when all that debate will be done. All that debate, you're not going to debate that when you see standing in the most holy place the abomination that causes desolation, which is Obama standing in the, in the White House, just so you know. That's a secondary fulfillment. When you see Islam standing in the most high place, the most holy place of the United States, abomination that causes desolation, the, the abomination that causes desolation happened the day Obama was sworn in, and then he took away the daily sacrifice. You know what the daily sacrifice was? And I'm not saying this is the fulfillment that happens in Jerusalem. What I'm saying is it's a secondary fulfillment, is that since the day of, of George Washington, there was daily prayer in the White House. Every single day. And Obama put an end to that. 
So it's time to get your hearts right with God. And those of you who think it's going to be a pre-tribulation rapture, you're going to rebel from God. You're going to get angry from with God. You're, when, when the mark of the beast comes out and in, in the hour of God's judgment, all your assets, all your wealth is destroyed and comes to nothing. All the windows of your house are completely blown out. And those who live in a remote place, within three weeks, within three to four weeks, you got Muslims knocking on your door saying, this is our house now. You can live in, in you can live in as long as you're willing to be our personal servants and take the mark, you can stay living here. That's going to happen to people here in the United States. If your home is not destroyed when the nukes come down and you still have a, a nice place that's pretty nice to live in, guess what? There's going to come Chinese Communist Party, high-level Chinese Communists, and Muslims come knocking on your door with military officials right behind them saying, we own your house now, bow down to Islam, bow down to us, bow down and take this mark, and if you want to stay living in this house, you can have that little tiny bedroom the little tiny office room and you better be up every mo every morning to make us breakfast and do every chore that we ask you to do and if you don't do it we're going to rape your wife right in front of you that's the way they work that's what they're going to do and mark my words the sweetest most sweet little christian lady will boil her own child for food that's going to happen. It happened in the Old Testament. All these sweet little Christians who walk around going, Oh, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. It's a pre-tribulation rapture. You have no idea how wicked you are. You haven't even gone through a trial yet. The Bible says that when hardship comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Some of the sweetest, nicest Christians who've never really gone through a hardship or a trial and sit there talking about how God's going to rapture you up before we even ever see the, the, the Antichrist. When the Antichrist comes on the scene and all his people come to your door, knocking on your door, saying, we, we own you, you're going to see little, sweet little Christian girls get on their knees before a big Muslim Muhammad and give him mouth service. I'm not joking, and I'm talking about type of mouth service just so that she can get one more meal. And that's going to happen. I'm talking about... Um, of the sweetest little Christian people boiling their own children for one last meal. Because it's going to be famine. It's going to be great distress unequaled. After World War III, the hour of God's judgment. And I'm speaking by the power of God because God's going to serve to you all a reward for all the luxury you've given yourself. These same little Christians who talk about God's going to rapture us up have driven past homeless people Every day and never rolled their window down and given them a dollar or five dollars. Always said, oh, they're just going to buy beer and alcohol with my money. I'm not going to give them anything. And maybe they would have bought beer and alcohol. Oh, this guy's these rich pre preachers who live in multi-million dollar mansions, 4,500 square feet, 5,000 square feet, 10,000 square feet. That's small. 10, we moved out of our 10,000 square feet home. We're now in a 20,000 square foot home. And all these vacant rooms, and they live, they literally live in maybe 1,500 square feet of the, of the, of the 25,000 square foot home. You know why? Because they go into the kitchen, they use their, their bedroom, and they go into the living room. And the rest of the house is vacant. These people are wicked. You know why? Because they, there's, there's orphans. There's children who've been trafficked. There's people who need help, and you're going to live in luxury and self-indulgence, and you will end up taking the mark of the beast, you wicked inhabitants of the earth who never really believe that you believe God for money, riches, and wealth, and you threw away the verses of the Bible where Jesus said, there's one thing you lack, go sell everything you have and give to the poor. There's one thing, you, and where Jesus said, uh, Luke 14, 33. That's why the mark of the beast is going to happen before the rapture. So, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord. And I'm telling you, you'll know I'm a true prophet when World War III happens and the mark of the beast still hasn't happened. After World War III, there's a time of no wind guaranteeing you that that's the sixth seal. Okay? And Revelation 7, 1 says, talks about a time of no wind anywhere in the world. That's after the sixth seal. That's after World War III. When the mark... When Russia and China come rising out of the sea onto the shores of Babylon the Great. You'll know I'm a true prophet. 
When the mark of the beast comes out, you'll know I'm a true prophet because the rapture has not yet happened. Everything I said in this video will come to pass. Okay? And so all of you who are believing God for a pre-tribulation rapture, you're already too late. You're already too late. And then you're going to stand there and say, God pours out his wrath for a full seven years. I'm sorry, but you deserve wrath for seven years, maybe. Just for teaching that God would do such a thing. It's three and a half years. And it starts with the hour of God's judgment. So, here's what I'm saying. Everybody who teaches that the rider on the white horse is, is the Antichrist, you need to repent right now. And if you've taught that, you need to get on there and, and undo what you've done. If you do not, you've offended that angel. If you refuse to repent, you've offended the angel in charge of the rapture. And there's another angel who's in charge of the fire, and he's reassigned to you. Revelation chapter 14, verse 14 through 20 is the rapture. It's the same event as Jesus described in Matthew chapter 13, verse 37 through 41. It's going to happen exactly as is written. Where does Jesus, when he returns, the second coming, where does he first land his feet? Mount Zion with 144,000. Revelation 14, 1 through 5. Then that sequence of events ends. You need to get your Bible out. So we see the rapture happens in uh, Revelation 7, verse 9. Multitude in heaven before the Lamb of God. It doesn't happen in Revelation chapter uh, 4 and 5. Because there's no multitude. Unless you think that the rapture happens and there's only 24 people. I'm just saying, do you really want it to be? No, there's a multitude. I go with that one. I'd rather have a multitude. I'd rather, because I can at least believe that I'm part of that multitude. If there's only 24 people in heaven when the rapture happens, after the rapture, Revelation chapter 5, that means we're all pretty much screwed. But if you look at Revelation 7, 9, you'll see a multitude that no one could count. That represents the rapture has happened. That's God's barn full of wheat. Okay? Then the sequence of events ends at the seventh trumpet. The sixth trumpet and the sixth bowl of God's wrath is the same event. Study it out. It's the final war at the end of the age that happens in the Euph region of the Euphrates River. Begins in the re region of the Euphrates River. Then the seventh trumpet is the same event as the seventh bowl of God's wrath. It's the return of the Lord where he comes down and lands his feet on Mount Zion. At the seventh trumpet, the sequence of events ends and a new sequence of events begins in Revelation 12.1. And that first event happened in, in September 2017. The woman clothed with the sun. That's the sign in the sky happened in September. So you want to know where we are? On September, in September of 2017, Revelation 12.1 was fulfilled. That begins that sequence of events. Then another sign, China, the enormous red dragon, with seven heads and ten horns, that's the government of the Antichrist, sends stars from the sky to the earth. That's your World War III event. Then what happens next? Revelation chapter 13, the beast rises out of the sea. Then what happens next? At the same time the beast is rising out of the sea, the second beast is rising out of the earth. We're seeing the beast that rises out of the earth right now. These riots, these people who are shooting and killing police, the Black Lives Matter and Antifa group, that is the second beast. The people of that group, that's the second beast. Then what happens? The mark of the beast comes out. Revelation chapter 13, 11, 10 and 11, 8, 9, 10. And Revelation chapter 13, I think it's 12. Anyway, somewhere in there, but you'll see the mark of the beast comes out. Then, Revelation 14, 1, that sequence of events ends. So, Revelation 12, 1 to 14, 5 is a, se is a short sequence of events that begins September 23rd, 2017 and ends with the second coming of the Lord, where he comes down and lands his feet on Mount Zion, the Lamb of God. Then another sequence of events begins, Revelation chapter 14, 6, going all the way back to the day of Pentecost when the angel of the gospel is released into the earth. And then the last thing he does is says, give, fear God and give him glory for the hour of God's judgment has come. He steps off the scene and his next assignment is, to, is the rapture. Okay, and then another angel in, who 
proclaims, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great. So Babylon the Great falls, and then a third angel followed. This sequence of events goes all the way through to the seventh bowl of God's wrath, which is the end of the age when Jesus returns the second coming. So the second coming is the seventh trumpet, Revelation 14, verse 1 through 5, and also Revelation, uh, the, the, the seventh uh, bowl of God's wrath. That's all the same event. Then we also have... The second coming happens in Revelation 19, verse 11 through 20. That's the seventh or the sixth bowl of God's wrath and the sixth trumpet and the seventh bowl of God's wrath and seventh trumpet. The final war is described in Revelation 19, starting in verse 11, where Jesus returns and all the nations are gathered and all the birds of the air come and feast on the dead. That is the second coming of the Lord. That's the final battle that starts in the region of the Euphrates. So there's three, there's four sequences of events in the book of Revelation. And the fourth sequence of events begins in Revelation chapter 17 verse 1. Now the whore on the beast, who is that? That's the apostate church. That's Remember they say the church doesn't appear in the book of Revelation. That's because after chapter 3... That's because the church includes you who are lukewarm, you who hold to the teachings of the Nicolaitans, you who hold to the teachings of Balaam, you who tolerate that woman Jezebel, and Jezebel is all included in the church in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. But in Revelation chapter 14, verse 14 through 20, we see that God's wheat is gathered into the barn. That's the first angel of the harvest, and then the angel in charge of the fire takes the grapes and throws them into the wine press of God's wrath. What are the grapes? The grapes are, are the lukewarm. The grapes are the weeds among the wheat. The grapes are the foolish virgins. They're thrown into the wine press of God's wrath. Jesus said in Luke, in uh, in John chapter 15 verse 1, I am the vine. Jesus said he is the vine and he said to his disciples, you are the branches. But the grapes are not part of the vine they are always they're part of the vine for a season and they all they do is suck all the nutrients out of the vine they're the self-centered goats who i was hungry and you did not feed me i was thirsty and you did not give me drink these are the i gotta tell you they're the chelsea bedells who say that's dead works any good deed you do for someone is a dead work that's what she'll teach you oh you don't have to do anything for the lord Yet she'll go around her house and do the laundry. Is that a dead work when your house is a mess and you clean up the house? Is it a dead work when your husband goes out and, and cuts the grass? and, and do, or, or, or is it a dead work when you do the dishes and empty the dishwasher? No. In the same way, God's household has work that needs to be done. It's not dead works if you're led by the Holy Spirit. I'll tell you what dead works is. When the Lord tells you to go out and preach the gospel, and instead you go and volunteer at the church. The volunteering at the church is dead works. Going out and obeying God to preach the gospel, that is what God told you to do. That's never dead works. Okay? Anytime you obey God, it's not dead works. I remember going to a church where they had a, um, a, a, a food outreach. And I went to this the food outreach. It was like on a Friday night. And the whole place was full of Christians. There was like four or five homeless people in the whole place. And the Lord spoke to me and said, Every single person is here to get a free meal. They don't really care about feeding the poor. And there was like four or five people who were poor people in that pl whole place. And there was like 30 volunteers who were all there for a free meal. That is dead works. When you go to the food outreach, not because you want to help the poor, but because you want a free meal. That is dead works. Okay? I knew a lady who said that she does her good deed for the week is volunteering at the, uh, at the local thrift store. The Lord spoke to me and told me she goes to volunteer at the thrift store so that she can be the first to get whatever really good donation comes in. Somebody donates something really nice, she's the first one to pick it up. That's dead works. But if you go out and do good deeds for the Lord and anything that like that you do for God as out of obedience to the Holy Spirit or because you love Him, that is not dead works. That is a labor of love. Okay, um... 
All right, it's the end of the age, and everybody who teaches that the rapture happens before the mark of the beast comes out, they're almost all, and I'm not going to say all of them, but almost all of them are going to end up taking the mark of the beast. They're going to be thrown into the wine press of God's wrath, okay? So don't be foolish. Be ready to stand firm in your faith. And at the time that this happens, it's too late because when World War III happens and the, and the hour of God's judgment comes, that's the cry that rings out at midnight that wakes up all the foolish virgins. It's the doomsday. World War III, remember the doomsday clock? Well, when World War III happens, it strikes that doomsday clock strikes midnight. And in the parable of the ten virgins, Matthew chapter 25, it says, At midnight, the cry rings out. Get ready for the bridegroom. Here he comes. That's when all the foolish virgins realize they don't have enough oil in their vessels. That's when they suddenly realize that they never obeyed God. And that any time the Holy Spirit told them to do something, they said, that's dead works. I'm saved by grace. And they rejected what the Lord was telling them to do. Okay, so the cry that rings out at midnight is the doomsday clock. And when that cry rings out, it's World War III, the sixth seal, the hour of God's judgment. World War III will last one hour. You can have five nuclear strikes with these hypersonic nukes and submarine launched. So get ready because it's the end of the age.